thank you everyone for joining us in this uh, fifth panel um, about the economic resilience of the border. We have uh, three amazing panelists, uh, and I am sure that we are going to learn a lot of things from them. Um, here at the table, let me introduce uh, Kenya uh, Samaripa, is the Executive Director of International Business Affairs at the San Diego Regional Chamber. Lance uh, Jungmeyer, uh, the president of Fresh Produce uh, Association of the Americas, and Gerald Shevel, executive vice president of the International Bank of Commerce. So thank you all for joining us. Um, as I told you at the beginning, my idea would be create a vivid conversation. So feel free to jump, to intervene, and to enrich the uh, conversation today. Uh, I would like to start uh, uh, with a general question, the same for all of you, um, three, four minutes each, uh, to talk about the uh, resilient uh, of the economy at the border, how, how resilient is, is the economy of the border. I'm going to start with um, Kenya, and uh, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Um, and there's so many things I want to sh share about that, and I'm sure we all have been witnesses of how resilient our border communities are. I mean, we saw everything from the borders being shut down, uh, border restrictions in place. Um, and I think that gave us an opportunity to, to really act on how the border communities are a role model for what the U.S.-Mexico relationship should be like. Um, if you remember, right with the pandemic hit, we'd had, uh, the U.S. and Mexico had this discrepancy on what classified as an essential business. Um, and that had a, an immediate impact on our supply chains. And so what we did is, you know, look at the local and regional levels and say, how can we work together with those local and, and state governments to make sure that what was considered essential on each side wasn't impacted? Um, and so by um, creating those communication channels and leveraging this history of collaboration that we had in place, we were able to reopen at least 80 businesses within that first week you know, and get our economy back on track. And um, again, using those same channels and collaboration and just the desire to get through the pandemic and through everything and reactivating an economy, um, San Diego and Baja, or more specifically Tijuana, launched the first cross-border vaccination program. Um, so in collaboration with the county and the private sector, that reached 26,000 workers in Tijuana employed by U.S.-based agencies and companies um, so that we could, again, reopen those businesses. And that, of course, was later replicated in Texas and goes to show how, again, we're being that role model of what we can accomplish while, you know, the federal and levels and capitals are still debating what to do. Um, so in that sense, you know, we're also looking at how can we expand that cross-border collaboration. We um, have identified some flaws and threats on our supply chains. Uh, we see more and more companies being less and less likely to offshore to destinations that on, which only benefit is low-cost labor, right? And here is Mexico, right there, right south of the border. Um, so in that way, you know, San Diego has created a 2.5 billion economic um, integrated supply chain with Baja California that can only grow moving forward and we're starting to see how we can complement resources right we have a san diego airport that is quite limited because of where it's located but we see and we recognize the potential at the tijuana airport and this neighboring cargo facility that can help distribute everything that we have going on all that trade commerce you know 90 percent of the if everything that California exports to Mexico goes through our ports of entry. So how can we leverage those, those resources in order to expedite and reduce those shipping times, to reduce congestions at our ports of entry? How can we leverage that airport to reduce um, our dependency on trucks and our dependency on the Long Beach seaport that is, you know, I think we have all seen and heard and being impacted in one way or another on those delays. So again, looking in, at Mexico and, and and really expanding our collaboration and being more, in, more intentional on our collaboration with our partners south of the border so we can, again, not only be resilient during times of crisis, but also um, take it to the next level and not only reactive our economy, but um, really expand in our economy and, and increase our global competitiveness. Gerald. Well, from our perspective, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the invitation for the World Center and the Border Trade Alliance. Uh, 
I've, been, I've come to every single conference or participated in the conference here for day one. So, uh, and in eight years, uh, but I will tell you, it's not just eight years, but uh, I am probably, you know, together with my friend Sam Vale, who's in the back, probably uh, a senior member of this of this group of exhausted roosters, and we were focusing on border <laughs> resiliency since uh, since the 80s. But uh, from our perspective, I think one of the things that some things do not change. Uh, we, what we were talking about back in the 80s, we're still talking about today, which involves uh, not only processes, involves uh, infrastructure uh, needs, in, involves the importance of the national significance or international significance of our border facilities in order to facilitate and maintain our competitiveness. From our standpoint, uh, I think it's important to, to reflect uh, what we looked like perhaps back in the 80s to what we look like today. I, I get encouraged by hearing all these $2 billion of infrastructure funds that on the border infrastructure, on the, uh, on the infrastructure bill is included. Uh, in 1993, we were excited because we got $386 million of funding through Senator Graham just for the border, the entire border. Put that in perspective, okay, to where we are today. In Texas, we're working, uh, and I live in Laredo, Texas. I thank God that I live in Laredo, Texas, that I work in Laredo, Texas every day, you know, because we get to live and see the importance of what trade is all about in the entire North American region. But we have a lot to catch up on. So from, our, from, our, from, from what we focus our attention on is, is infrastructure uh, is such an important element to maintain our competitiveness uh, uh, in the global environment. And by having to be in, 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 in a port like Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, the demands of how we meet our competitiveness model is tr truly based on the people of the border. Uh, Jaime said I used to say governments don't trade, people trade. And we that are, are the trade community of the border, and that involves everyone being essential, by the way. I don't like the word non-essential. You know, I like the word we're all essential. And I think the entire border has been an essential component of the economies of our three countries. USMCA and NAFTA were, were the driving framework agreement that, that proved the importance of having adequate infrastructure and processes of, of, of economy uh, in order to maintain that residency. So from our, from my point of view, I, I, I want to get away from uh, some of the things that, that perhaps we've been hearing a lot more about. I think, Kenya, you alluded to it. The nearshoring. I like to, I like, I like the words more friend shoring, or ally shoring, than I like the nearshoring, and I think that if we if we focus our attention in, in 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 understanding that three countries, the values and the strengths of the three countries, Canada and U.S. and Mexico, which is U, what USMCA is all about, will make us all better to compete in that resiliency that 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 we find on the border. Uh, I set the tone for that, but that but trade is also an, uh, is what we were talking about, but we cannot forget that uh, in order for that truck to get across through a border, uh, the driver needs to be vetted. So the migration or the immigration uh, element of the, the people that come back and forth and are part of the border mm -hmm. economy that adds to the significance of the entire North American economy, that, that we, we have to focus our attention in, in addressing the, the, the immigration laws of, of our country in order to continue to meet the demand of our competitiveness for, for, for the North American region and the world. I set that tone because I'm sure we want to have that dialogue and that sure. discussion. Sure, sure. Security and immigration reform is something that I think would be very interesting to talk of today. Uh, Lance, your turn. Well, thank you uh, to the Wilson Center and, and BTA for, for the invitation to speak. You know, I think... Um, the First Produce Association of America helps our, our companies with all the issues at the border related to uh, any kinds of inspections that occur with USDA, FDA, CBP. And so that puts us on, on the front line of this. We were founded in 1944, and so we have um, working a lot of years with, with the various partners. What strikes me about sh what you're saying about ally shoring, friend shoring, our, our industry was really one of the first to do this. We, we had, um, in the late 1800s, um, American on, entrepreneurs noticed, well, you can't get all the fruits and vegetables you want in the wintertime, but we have a good friend in Mexico. The The infrastructure is improving. We're linking by train to these places. So um, 
this is a an old industry and it's an industry that's very important and we see that that the food industries whether it's fresh produce dairy livestock grains between our two countries between our three countries extremely integrated when when we saw the pandemic come there was in fact at, at first an incredible burst of demand for fresh produce and then it 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 nosedived but it recovered pretty quickly because people have to eat and um for, for that reason you know the i think the pandemic demonstrated why the, the people who work in this industry whether they're the warehouse workers the uh, inspection officers for usda or cbp nobody quit everybody kept going we were essential workers and <clears throat> the, the importing towns never shut down and we always had food in our supermarkets uh, one of the things we recognize that about that is that we we named our member of the year the essential worker instead of a company owner or, or somebody who uh, made great individual contributions no it was everybody and so having said that the supply chain is extremely fragile and we're, we're seeing that all across um, you know we can talk about that later but I think fuel uh, expenditures for packaging um, s supply of drivers all these things are are, are, are intersecting right now <laughs> to make it extremely difficult um, to, to, to make sure that we continue in the forward with these businesses because food inflation is something that's real and we we, we have a role all together to keep it down but we are in challenging times. Cool. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Jory, you, you mentioned the situation at the border uh, some years ago and today. What are the main um, uh, changes that we can see uh, today from the past and lessons that we can learn and how the border situation has changed and has evolved? Well, I think the most uh, vivid example is, of course, is USMCA when we expanded uh, the number of chapters from NAFTA from 22 chapters to the 33 chapters and we included a customs and trade facilitation chapter uh, and, and a competitiveness chapter within USMCA. Uh, I think uh, by adding and uh, improving a, an agreement uh, further, and then it's not a perfect, none, none of these agreements are all perfect, they don't solve all the problems of the world. I saw that, the, that, that I think uh, our experiences of NAFTA uh, allowed us to to say, hey, there's more work to be done, and we need to to uh, to strengthen the the process of how people and goods come back and forth in order to maintain our competitiveness. So that's one big change I saw that by you know incorporating chapters such as small and medium enterprises, a chapter on competitiveness, a, a chapter that brought it to the current century of digital trade and e-commerce. All of those chapters are evolving as an evolving document. That's one of the things that, I, that, that we were encouraged. But there is one element that has not changed, and that is the demand of our infrastructure of our border, and that is not keeping pace to the growth of, of, of trade. It, it, you know, and it's never ahead. Infrastructure is never ahead. It always seems to be lagging. And, and our challenge that we have on the border, which are all small communities, predominantly with the exception perhaps of cities like San Diego and, uh, and Tijuana or El Paso and Juarez, most of the cities along the border are less than 300 population as the city itself. So there's, a, there's limited capacity for to rely on those cities to provide the adequate infrastructure, which are of a national In or North American significance. Who is responsible for that, the Congress? Well, definitely, definitely it's, 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 the, it's making sure that Congress understands that uh, these are not just local issues, these are North American challenges. So I, say, I would say that the infrastructure money that you allocate for the border is going to benefit other states as Michigan's or, or Nebraska's. And we sold NAFTA on, on that premise. And, and so infrastructure is, is, is something that we've got to continue to share with other members of Congress. Uh, um, Kenny, do you agree with that? And uh, is Congress more responsible than any other um, administration levels? Uh, when it we certainly talk about the has a, an important role. And I wanted to add, actually, along the same lines, because it, it can be frustrating that we continue to come to D.C., we go to Mexico City, and we continue to bring the same issues or urge action on the same items year after year. But we also have reached some important milestones. 
Um, we certainly have seen that, you know, in support of trade or as we continue to increase trade between our nations, we, we have been, at least in the San Diego region, also successful at securing the funds to continue to invest in border infrastructure. Um, the, the ambassador just mentioned Otay Mesa East or Otay II. Um, in the past five, six years, we inaugurated a, a, an additional pedestrian port of entry in the San Isidro. Uh, Port of Entry, which helped process, you know, 20 to 25,000 people every day. And then we installed double booths on our passenger vehicle uh, lanes that help process up to 70,000 vehicles every day. But there are still challenges that come, come as a result of that. Um, we have now issues in terms of staffing. The, the double booths are not staffed. Um, the Ped West, the, the port of entry that I mentioned, was closed first because of the pandemic and the border restrictions, yet here we are seven months later and the border restrictions were lifted and the port continues to be shut down. So now we have an issue in terms of staff, a desperate need, and we're urging Congress and the Senate, well, thank you, you know, for securing the funds that we needed to invest in border infrastructure. Could we please have now the staff so that those ports of entry and infrastructure can operate at full capacity in an efficient way. Because as long as you know we're connected with Mexico and we're trying to collaborate and, and leverage our resources to uh, strengthen our supply chains, but is, if that connectivity is not efficient, then that impacts our global competitiveness. Once. Well, I think um, you, you said something struck me. And, and when we saw that the within the past six to nine months, the, the federal government came out the, with an infrastructure plan. And uh, very quickly, we we're all like, well, great, we're going to get some infrastructure specifically to, to the border regions. As news started to trickle out about how it was going to be used, I saw it kind of unfortunate. Um, I was hearing that the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration was going to use the money to add more inspection stations and more inspection officers. Okay, great, we need inspections. But we also have a state agency that does the exact same thing. And we see that there needs to be better coordination between those two to do the same job rather than adding more inspections that actually slow down the commerce. So um, you, your question a little bit goes about how do we decide where that money goes. Um, if it's strictly highway funding, oftentimes the, the state Department of Transportation has to make that choice. And it's a constant struggle to make everyone else in the state understand, well, yes, we're way down on the border, but everything we do impacts the whole rest of the state, the whole rest of the country. And so, you know, the it starts at Congress, in the United States Congress, and the money starts to trickle down, but it, sometimes things get lost in translation. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I would add, just again, to put things in perspective, when we come to those of us from the border that come up here, we have to constantly be educating the members of Congress of what you know, is happening that impacts the entire nation. I'll give you an example. And, and, I'm, and being from Laredo, we have four bridges in Laredo. First bridge was built in 1954. Second bridge was built in 1976. The third bridge was built in 1993. And then the fourth bridge was built in the year 2000. So we take the 93, which is the year NAFTA was passed. In 93, trade, you know, our binational trade was $100 million, okay? So 20 years later, when the next bridge of 2000, you know, our trade had gone from two, up to 247, we're working on a fifth bridge now, and it's 20 years later. Again, something happens with 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, but the trade has continued to grow. So our, that's an example of where Congress is not really addressing the demand of, of the adequate infrastructure for, for us. Let, let me ask you something, because n none of you talk about security security itself about the border. And uh, w you mentioned we should uh, educate members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Do you think that members of Congress and politicians in general talk too much about security and too um, little, too little about competitiveness? I will tell you, yeah. I, I, I live in, you know, I, I feel secure. You know, we have more law enforcement folks on the border than perhaps other parts of the country, you know, and therefore, you know, some of the safest cities are on the board, you know, not because I say it, it's because it's, it's uh, but, but the rhetoric sounds that the, the element of security seems to be an element where by talking about the challenges or the, or the problems of security, there is a financial gain from having that message out there. Uh, 
And uh, I'm, I'll, I'll be bold enough to say it. Some of it comes from our law enforcement agencies that say, hey, we have a, a security challenge, so therefore we need more money. Throw in more money into security, but at the end, the trade is secure trade. And there's an element, we all want secure trade. Mm -hmm. We all want to participate in keeping and, and being safe. I don't feel threatened in Laredo, Texas, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but, I, but I understand, I also don't stick my hand in the sand and understand that if I want to go to Nuevo Laredo, I, you know, uh, I have to be more cautious. I know where to go at 10 o'clock at night in Washington, D.C., you know, and where not to go in Washington, D.C. at 10 o'clock at night. So the same element of individual responsibility and how to take care of yourself is, is the element. And I think, I think that we are resilient in, in the border to, to know what, what, what to look for. Yeah, and if I may add, sorry, it's just also I think that it's a matter of understanding that security and, and trade are not mutually exclusive. Like it's not the one is more important than the other. We all want secure trade and legal trade and the legal you know, movement of people and goods across the border. But um, it's not what we hear when we are, you know, listening to Congress members. It's always one or the other. Um, and that comes to with us, you know, constantly coming and re-educating um, and, and sharing our stories and our successes and our challenges. And then we have elections again. So it's like restarting that process over and over. I think uh, journalists also has part of responsibility in that, asking always the same questions about <laughs> security and not competitiveness. Uh, let's move the conversation forward. Um, Lens, I, I would like to hear from you the lessons that we have learned from the pandemic. Well, um, I, I'd say I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the importance of, of food a, as part of, of the fabric of our countries. And I, I think the three countries of North America, Mexico, United States, and Canada, are in a very good position to withstand any kind of uh, global calamities like this. We all work very closely together to make sure that we're supplied with complementary food items. It, it's, it highlights, in fact, the need for our governments to work even more closely. I was really pleased to, to hear the comments from the State Department earlier and, and their counterparts in Mexico about how they're working more closely together. I would agree with earlier comments that, that over the course of four or five years, the, the relationship declined and, and, and was not as productive. Um, having seen how productive it was previously and how closely each government agency was working together um, within the United States and Mexico together to solve problems of food safety, to solve problems of, of uh, how do we reduce water use, how do we reduce chemical use, how do we make progress on, on rights for, for laborers. That, that is work that has to continue every day. And it highlights, I think, the reason that, that we need to have a, a, a common understanding of what is the value of the relationship. Because there are so many people in Congress and in the media and elsewhere who want to, to seize upon the border and say, well, it's insecure. We need more and more security. And it totally drives the conversation away from the value that the jobs bring to, to the region, <clears throat> to, to those local economies, and the extreme challenges that those communities already have due to all the security pressure. Jerry mentioned uh, the law enforcement in his area. In Nogales, uh, Arizona, it's in Santa Cruz County, it's about 45,000 people in the county. It's estimated that for every uh, law enforcement, there are five people in the county. So every five person has one law enforcement. Extremely safe. And the, the conversations get blown out of the water, and, and frankly, every other state is much more, much more loud. Uh, uh, I'm one of the lessons that we learned is the importance of supply chain mm -hmm. and disruptions what it means to every one of us. And if you have any disruptions in along the border of that supply chain, you know, you're either not gonna get the food that you're accustomed to getting. But Lance said that the supply chain is extremely fragile. This is one of the lessons that we have learned from the pandemic. Have, you, ha, have we learned the lesson and increased the, the, the reliability of the supply chain? Well, definitely, I, I think definitely we, we understand, we have identified which, which sectors uh, are, are, have an impact on our lives. Pharma is one of those. We relied on uh, perhaps in China for a lot of our pharmaceuticals. Why, you know, I, I see that as an opportunity for us in North America to bring pharma closer to, mm -hmm. to, to the largest consumer of the world, the United States. So, That's you know, near showing. 
Pardon me? That's near that's, shoring. Uh, well, that should be ally shoring, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> because, you know, Mexico should be a good ally, you know, and, and that's just from my, from my perspective. But, but we also, I think what we learned is how, how we say that on the border, we are, we are, you know, those communities along the border, we're so integrated. Our economies, our cultures, and our history are so integrated. We're one community in two countries, you know, but yet we tend to think that the opportunities are elsewhere outside of the North American region or, or this Western Hemisphere. So therefore, I think we have to, to realize, let's, let's think about, rethink that, mm -hmm. and what would we could, as the Western Hemisphere or even as the North American region, identify those sectors that are fundamental to our livelihood and strengthen those sectors and allow us to, to do business with each other versus then relying on Europe or Asia from the competitive point of view. Yeah. Kenny, any comments? Yeah, actually, I, it's funny because I wrote down rethinking the supply chain and better understanding our supply chain for our ally shoring. So I think we're in the process of that. We certainly, we're still sort of like getting along there. Um, and also, I think we've also realized, on, and this, I'm sure this is true all, all over the border, that shockingly, we didn't have cross-border plans in place and communication channels across every single agency and every single department and, and along every city that we should have before the pandemic. So we had to sort of like learn as we go. Um, and that's something that we need to adopt and strengthen long term. Um, and of course, we again realize that we are um, interdependent economically, but that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's just something that, again, we're deepening our of understanding of our economy and what can we do to be more intentional about how we work together with one another and, and with the state and local governments across the border and along the border moving forward. Interesting. There is one thing that I would like to arise in this conversation, which is the uh, problem of undocumented workers. Uh, today I read an, uh, a report uh, that was leaked from uh, Amazon. It, it was an internal uh, document that raised the uh, point that in 2024, the logistical company in the U.S. is going to have problems finding workers for their uh, operations. How, how important is the uh, immigration reform in that perspective? And if you fear, as that report state, uh, that companies that you represent, you know, or you work with, and you work with, that would have the same problem, the same challenge in the near future. And the report was talking about 2024, which is right at the corner. Mm -hmm. Kenya. I think it, it's something we're already seeing. Uh, in fact, there's a, a recent study that was studying the workforce in, in our region. Um, and points out how, you know, San Diego has a lack of engineers. And at the same time, Baja California is producing plenty. So um, we, our community and our businesses really rely on those work visas and, and non-immigrant visa programs to really connect with the workers they need. So it's out of question. That's something that's already happening. And it's another way, I think, for near shoring or ally shoring, because there's a resource that our, our side of the border needs and it's right there. So we are in critical need of, of that immigration reform. Lutz. Two sides to this, I think. You, you have an incredible need for agriculture workers in the United States, no matter what state you're, you're looking at, um, but particularly where fruits and vegetables are grown. They have a hard time getting the workers they need to pick the fruits and vegetables in a timely manner that, that, that makes, makes business, frankly, very difficult for them. Um, at the same time, creating a good guest worker program would, would knock out a lot of the problems that we see at the border. You give people a chance to come across, do their work, go back home, and do it again the same thing the next year. Well, you, you've all of a sudden knocked down a lot of the security problems at the border, and, and you've created a path uh, even to, to collect taxes. Now, I know these things are controversial for, for many politicians to handle, but this, these are the facts. You fix one problem, you fix the other. Um, we see... At the border, too, an acute need for workers. Um, all across the country, just, just like anywhere, nobody wants to, to work in jobs that are, that are physical or that are demanding. Um, so when you're working in warehouses, driving forklifts, doing other works, driving trucks, you know, those, these are not jobs that everybody wants to do. And so we see uh, it's difficult to hire who, who people need. And, and, you know, I think all industries have to look, is there a solution for bring in foreign workers for jobs that Americans don't want to do, and how do you streamline that? Because right now it's, it's a very difficult program to access. 
I, I would I would add that we one of the things we talk about we, we use the word comprehensive immigration reform, mm -hmm. and you take the word comprehensive people you know somebody needs to comprehend what actually immigration mm -hmm. laws are. Let's and give him a round of applause. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so if you start from that element, and we understand that the system that we have is not working, what will it take to change it and make it better? Whether it's a guest worker program or reforming our immigration laws and bring them to today's environment where we have a demographic challenge that we cannot have, we're, we're not having more kids, and therefore we need to find more workers because we have more, you know, people. In our North American region, you take 360 million, Amer you know, people in the United States, 120 in Mexicans, 40, 50 million, you know, Canadians. As a North American region, you know, look at what Canada is doing. Look at, you know, others. We need more immigrants, but the process to make them come and do what they need to do to add value to our country needs to be streamlined and make it effective, not delayed and take long periods of time, because you're scared that they're going to take somebody's job away. We, but, we, Jerry, uh, we need them. If, if this is that clear, why Congress is not paying attention to this need and uh, agree on something, as we saw this week, actually today, in uh, gun reform? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they reach an agreement. Is it possible? Yes. But in immigration, when we talk about immigration, it seems impossible. Right. Well, there's no political will right now to solve any problems right now. And... Uh, from our perspective, uh, there is money to be made off of chaos and disruption and uh, turmoil. And therefore, we've got to solve. We, we've been talking about, from those of us on the border, of recommending some common sense solutions to border management. And we encourage the members of Congress, the, the lawmakers, to come to, to the border, listen to the stakeholders, not just to the public stakeholders, mm -hmm. but to the private sector stakeholders, the SMEs that have to employ the workers and have to make sure that they produce it and they flow that commerce, you know, securely, mm -hmm. legitimately, for the benefit of all. Yeah, and I, I wanted to add on this because, yes, uh, comprehensive reform is really what is needed. And it's, and it's comprehensive because there's a lack of understanding of the whole problem. <coughs> and, like, and also not, an important point that I think we haven't touched on is that not every Mexican looking for an opportunity to work in the States wants to live in the States. So it's not entirely that they want to migrate. They just want an opportunity to come back and forth, you know. And there's an issue there of people that have maybe green cards and they're crossing the border, but they, you know, they're stuck in the system that they don't really understand either. Um, and there, you know, we could be looking at uh, temporary visas or day visas or industry visas in which we can maybe that's the middle point, you know, just filling those gaps within our workforce and people not necessarily moving into the states. It's just commuters back and forward. This is a panel uh, mostly with private sector representatives. Uh, um, my final point before going to the questions is um, uh, give me examples, highlight uh, situations in which public and private partnerships uh, with private sector and public uh, organizations or governments uh, are good examples. Uh, they worked uh, as, for example, the OTA Mesa DOS that was a good um, uh, example of cooperation, Kenya. Yeah, I mean, that's coming. Uh, of course, you know, we've talked about CBX before, the cross border bridge. Um, I mentioned the cross border vaccination program again with the county of San Diego. You know, shout out to your supervisors for donating those, um, those vaccines. And then, um, you know, that we had, now that we're talking about USMCA, the, the double or was it the joint inspection? Um, program at, at, at the ports of entry that started at the border too and was you know in San Diego and was later replicated and codified in USMCA. Um, so those are examples of how we're collaborating between each other and really listening, and that later gets replicated all over the place. You know. So, I think there's what I said earlier about um, being a small community and, and the difficulty in getting the attention of infrastructure uh, money is is, is real. But we we did find a way in Nogales, Arizona, to 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 get past this. Um, there was a brand new port of entry that was built uh, about ten years ago. It's one of the most modern ones on the southern border. And between that port of entry and the interstate highway was a state route of about three miles, with numerous stop signs and and uh, old fashioned e exits that were you know you get big trucks coming to a stop and trying to get moving. It, it's it's very difficult. So we. Uh, Continue into the state. How, do, how can we build this? And they said, well, 
you, you need to bring some money to the table. And so there was a, there was a, a fee that the, the trucking industry was already paying, and uh, we worked with the state legislature to direct those funds, uh, half of them to the state of Arizona, half of them to the county of Santa Cruz, and half of them, I'm sorry, quarter to Santa Cruz and quarter to the state of Nogales to gather those funds to use for infrastructure projects specifically. They took that money, they worked with the state and, and congressional grants and leveraging things, and we're able, we just this past year broke, uh, opened up a 100 plus million dollar flyover um, through a PPP project. This is by the fresh produce trucks paying an extra fee and having those funds redistributed. So it can work, and it's it, it takes will. I would add that you know I, I have I have high respect for any public servant, whether they be elected or they be appointed, you know, in government. And this, the, it, but at the same time, what I find ourselves is that when folks from Washington come to the border, you know, they want to meet public to public, you know, sectors. There's very, there's very little public, you know, to private sector dialogue and discussion. So if a congressman comes down, or even an agency comes down, they want to come to Laredo, they want to hop on a boat on, with a flag vest on and ride the river to talk about security. They don't want to talk to the Chamber of Commerce and say, hey, how do we protect and create more jobs and have that dialogue? I would like to have a mechanism established, you know, structured where when a public official comes down to the border communities that they do must meet with the stakeholders, private sector stakeholders, and have ongoing dialogue. I commend the Wilson Center, I commend the Board of Trail Lines, because this is, we're having to come here. And we're coming here not to put a flak vest to walk into Longworth Building or Rayburn Building. We're coming here to have dialogue and discussion and how we can generate and, you know, create more economic vitality and strengthen, you know, our economy. And we would want the same thing, the reciprocity from, from our members to come down here and learn from the SMEs on the border, from the private sector stakeholders, and have that dialogue at the table. But it has, you have to create a structure. And, and until we create that structure, people are going to come in there and they're going to go where the path, you know, is maybe politically correct versus what is economically, you know, more advantageous for all. If you cannot rely on government, um, have you find in technology... Uh, the partner to find the solutions that you need. I, I I'm, I'm I'm the last tech guy to talk to. I still I'm a people person. I'm a banker. <laughs> I'm still old school. Do I you have Twitter? Do you have Twitter accounts or uh, Instagram? Wait, what? <laughs> no, I do not. I do not. I do not. I still believe. I still believe. I'm still the type of individual who likes to cross, look across, look at you in the eye, and say, "I might want to do business with you. Are you going to make?" Pay me back my loan. Are we going to sit down? <laughs> Not whether you can just punch in something in the machine. That's just me. I've been doing this stuff for 40 but, uh, years. But at least you use an ATM. Oh, of course. Okay. Of course. <laughs> and I have branches. Yes. All right. You know, but 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 the element of uh, I think you know, in in we're still it's people dealing with people. Okay. And we say sometimes what we have to live with the decisions that Washington makes or Mexico City makes. We the resilient people of the border, that's why I love the word resiliency, are the ones who have to adapt to all these changes. That's what's important, and we do. We've been doing it for generations. Yeah, and we come up with our technology sometimes, you know, but we still need funds and support from the government agencies. And we, have, and we come up with solutions as well, mm -hmm. but sometimes they want to listen, sometimes it, it all depends, they, they do not. Yeah, we, we, we need 100% scans of, of cargo coming into the country. Uh, non-intrusive inspection technology, which is being tested out by CBP right now, uh, and hopefully will be rolled out across all major commercial ports of entry, can, is, is crucial to that. When you have what amounts to a scan of a truck as it comes to the border, you don't necessarily have to stop the truck. It can <clears throat> roll through the scan, and uh, they can use that information to be smarter about where they interdict. So I think technology plays a huge role uh, in the security portion, as well as in other other areas that are impactful to society, um, where we're seeing uh, technology used to, to breed types of uh, fruits and vegetables that require less water, to grow these in greenhouses and shade structures that reduce the water, that reduce the uh, imp impact of pests getting in there, so then for, therefore you reduce the amount of chemicals. Consumers want fresh produce that's free of chemicals. So um, technology plays a huge role in food 
all throughout the supply chain and the border. And, and then we see uh, the issue of trucking right now. It's so hard to get truck drivers, so hard. But there are uh, truck companies experimenting with, with automated driving. And that is something that if we can't get a handle on the cost of shipping, it's going to go that way. We've had a hard time getting a handle on the cost of, of, of fast food server restaurants. You go in these days, most often you get a kiosk and not a person. So technology is going to light the way, um, but we do need to make sure that we find ways to do that, that create jobs and create value-add jobs. Let's open the conversation to the audience. There is a mic over there. Any questions over here? Please introduce yourself and go straight to the point. My name is Ralph Cowan, and I am a member of the board of, of uh, the directors of uh, the commissioners of the Port of Brownsville, and I'm a member of the BTA. The one problem that I see continuously on the border is, especially in our port down in Brownsville, McAllen, Laredo, Del Rio. It, the politicians come, but they don't. They they want to divert something that's going on somewhere else to come and create a, a crisis here by making a lot of noise about the security on the border, uh, la 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 la. And then we're working, trying to get to work comprehensively with the, come up with a plan that'll work so that we can prosper mutually. Mexico and the U.S. and I'm sure Canada, and so, and I don't have as you know a direct knowledge of. I've lived on Brown in Brownsville for 75 years, so I have a good knowledge of what happens there. And I know that every time Mexico gets a cold, we get pneumonia. <laughs> so, you know it it, and produce is something that in the in our end of the world now because they opened up the, the Masaclan Highway is prospered and some of it's been diverted from you but I think that you know everybody's winning all the way around because you've got more infrastructure and you can do more volume and but we've got to also find some way to get a guest worker program right after the Korean War and and, the, and World War II there was a shortage of workers of, that they needed to do to work to work the fields and work all the. They had a bracero program, which was a guest program, worker program, and it worked very well because the people that are coming here don't want to leave their families, mm -hmm. because when they leave their families and they're gone for two and three and four years, they get involved with somebody else yeah. and they, then they have another family and then that creates a big mess. Any questions for the panelists? I just want to know if the panelists agree with me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one that comment. Was smart. That was smart. <laughs> I, I agree that, that the crisis is in Washington, not in the border. It's created by Washington on the border. And, and we solve our problems on the border because we've been, we, like I said, we've been doing it. But we have to work together. We understand that whatever happens on the border impacts the whole region whole North American region. So we have to look for solutions and common sense solutions is something that we have to strive for. But there's got to have that dialogue with the stakeholders of the border. And us coming to the border once a year is not enough, of course. And so when they come to the border, we all have to be organized and structured and say, we're going to show you the, really what the border is all about, not what perhaps the mainstream media may be showing you that the crisis is really. There are a lot of good success stories on the border. We're here. We're all success stories here. We're all business, we're all resilient. But at the same time, there's never enough time to be telling that story over and over again, repeat it. Um, if well, I can respond to yeah, it, sure, I mean, sure. the, right now politicians are trying to score points using the border and border security. And it's, it's as simple as that. And it's extremely unfortunate. And, and we saw that highlighted when, when Governor Abbott uh, put in the trucking inspections. I will say they were bogus inspections. These inspections, we're right after the truck had already come through the port of entry. CBP had looked at it. The Federal Motor Carriers had looked at it. And then they set up a whole other inspection line and did 100% inspections of trucks. This backlogged the supply chain. It, it trapped truckers, truck drivers on international bridges for days at a time without facilities. They created a humanitarian crisis. 
in addition to the supply chain and hundreds of millions of dollars of, of fresh produce lost because this was for eight days. Is, and it was stated- Is this what uh, Governor, uh, Governor Abbott, Abbott did yes, in and, Texas? And, yes, and, and, and it was stated by he and his aides that this was not really about the security. It was about making a point. And, and they, they made their point for sure. And a lot of companies after that were saying, well, is, is Texas the place where I want to put all my eggs? And I think it's extremely unfortunate that uh, people will, will latch onto an issue without regard for what it does to the economies of the people <clears throat> who live there. To, I mean, there are people who couldn't go to work in the, in the, in the warehouses because, well, the produce wasn't crossing. So what did they do? They got laid off for a few days. It's, it's senseless. Yeah. yeah, but I do think that, you know, looking at the glass half full rather than half empty, that what, what, one of the things that we did realize is that there has to be greater dialogue communication between the 10 border governors. We got away from that when we stopped having the border governors conferences. And I think here's an example where, where Governor Abbott had to reach out to work with, you know, the governors of Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo León, and Tamaulipas. Because there hasn't been any, they had not there had been a distancing of, of that dog. So they had a failure to communicate. And, you know, it works both ways. We, we you know, our friends from Mexico need to communicate better with, with, with the border states on the U.S. side. We on the border, U.S. side need to communicate better with our, 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 our Mexican governors on that side. That's just one level of government. Then at the local level, we can communicate pretty good amongst ourselves. But you got state, and then imagine, mm -hmm. it, gets kinda, it gets more complicated as you go up the ladder yeah. to the federal a failure to communicate. At the local level, we pretty do. We, I think we do a pretty good job of communicating with each other and solving our problems. But sometimes when it goes up the ladder, those problems are created by higher ups upon us versus us creating for them. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Your name? Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Ruben Garibay uh, from uh, Laredo and, and also uh, Maverick County Eagle Pass. Um, my company, we're, we're in transportation. We use TN visas, uh, EB3s, we've used H2s, and in the farm we use the, uh, the uh, uh, agricultural ones as well. Um, you know, one of the, really the low-lying fruit here is just expediting what's already on the books. I mean, why even invent the wheel? It's already there. They just take too long. You know, and I think that that doesn't require congressional hearings and all kinds of uh, 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 law changes, just help us get the existing laws and existing processes expedited. You know, uh, I was just talking to uh, somebody from the State Department uh, in Laredo. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize, the, the, the name. But it, irrespective of, of the Department of Labor approving our visas, which we get those pretty quick. Actually, the Department of Labor, I got to give them, they, they move pretty quickly. They understand what jobs need to be filled. But I've been waiting for two years on some EB3 visas for the counseling to open. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're trying to do things right. We're trying to create taxpayers. I mean, the system would actually fund itself if these just if, if what the laws and the procedures that were in place would get expedited. So really, I, I understand, you know, getting the congressman to listen and move to the border. But why don't we just go straight to the agencies and find out what they specifically need to start speeding the what exists on the books done quicker that's it it's i think that's low-lying fruit and i think that would help things move a lot quicker get the 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 workers in place because i if i'm having that trouble i believe and i want to believe that other businesses are having the exact same issue waiting for countless to open why can't that be remote that's quite interesting and um if we're talking about the border it's because we have two countries and all your answers were focused on the U.S. administration in different levels. What about Mexico? What about Mexican government? What about the uh, Mexican states? Um, what's your impression? How helpful are they uh, in order to make the economy more competitive in the border when we talk about the border economy? Right. Well, so thanks. First, just to address this question is that I think we all wish it was that easy. And then when we meet with those agencies, it ends up being a funding issue, a resource issue. And that's where Congress gets in the way, right? And that's when it's like telling our story so that Congress member understands why we're asking for funding for the Labor Department, for the Transportation Department, for everything, right? So I wish it was that easy because it's almost as easy as we would like our border infrastructure to be functional, but then it's funding and then it's a Congress matter, right? Um, and then in terms of Mexico, um, I think I would like to share that, you know, obviously Mexico also has an issue with 
migrants and there's also an opportunity there or an, or an issue there for visa programs for those migrants if they decide to stay in Mexico and fortunately at least in the state of Baja what we've seen you know working closely with the with the chambers and business um, organizations down there is that the state and the federal uh, government have really stepped up. Um, you know, when, when migrants arrive to Mexico or the, to Baja and Tijuana in particular, um, there are now programs in place that are being developed and expanded to provide those migrants that decide, decide to stay uh, with an ID, some sort of ID card with um, temporary work visas or, or permits for them to work. You know, if, 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 they, if they have limited skills, maybe that's trained them at the manufacturer or maquilas, right? Um, and they're looking at even providing them with some sort of like banking resources now with the Bienestar Bank in, in Mexico so that they can get paid through the bank. So it's, it's, it's being interesting to, real, to see how it's being so, sort of like slow on the U.S. side and then Mexico sort of like... You know, when they when there's intention, like they really can expedite what they're what they they want to accomplish. As we have those work visas in place, they have IDs. They're looking at again those bank accounts for them to to get paid and and settled. Um, so why it's a question of why are we taking so long on this side then? Yeah. I, I think you this bring is, up a very excuse valid me, just point just to add one one thing. This is after paying expedited and premium processing. Yeah. I do that 100 yeah. percent. It's yeah. still two yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you gotta wait. You got you gotta wait your turn, even though you already paid up. You know, <laughs> you know, but but uh, you know, you bring up a very valid point in regards to, you know, you know, the Mexican side, Mexico. You know, our, at our end on the border, we worry about uh, northbound traffic, but we also worry about southbound traffic. In Laredo, you know, we charge a toll. We charge a toll southbound. Okay, so our community generates revenue from southbound traffic. So for us, we want the trucks to be moving and the vehicles and the people to be moving swiftly, the more people move as swiftly and efficiently as possible because that's part of our revenue source. You know, I don't rely on the government always to give me money. We generate it from at the local level. But we have to respect the sovereignty of the other country that they have challenges as well on staffing and resources and financial resources too. And we have it on the side. If you go to GSA right now, General Service Administration, or you go to 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 uh, DHS or CBP, they'll always tell you we don't have money. We don't have money. We don't have money. We can't have money to fund that. You know, we don't have money for a new bridge. We don't have money for you know for more staffing. So what do we have to do? We have to come up with programs and ideas and how do we meet that demand and, and and find solutions to those problems to accommodate you know our growing economy. Well, we see in uh, that the present administration in Mexico has has shifted a lot of the development monies and whether social or infrastructure towards the southern states rather than the northern states that's not across the board but it's a general statement um and and also the agencies that are charged with inspections particularly in agriculture and and customs they've been very challenged to have funding and have staff so i think those are some areas where we'll, we'll hopefully see in the future kind of a return to to recognizing that there's a lot of value in putting resources towards that U.S.-Mexico relationship, and I, I think it'll pay dividends. Yeah. I, there's one thing that, that we have not been talking in this, conf in this in, in today's conference that I think we have to be very cognizant about. There's a major paradigm change going on in Mexico, just in, in, the, in the process of flow of people and goods. So, you know, Mexico has had its process under the, uh, basically, Secretary Hacienda. Mm -hmm. you know, which was a, more of a tax revenue. And now it's going to switch over to aduanas. Now it's going to be basically quite military and, and aduanas. That's a major change of any, it's like I say, we're going from DHS, we're going from Treasury, we're going to DHS or one agency, one big agency to another. How do we, you know, make sure that that transition doesn't disrupt, you know, our, 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 our supply chain or doesn't disrupt, you know, how we've been doing business for the last, you know, 200 years, uh, and I think we also need to have proper planning and proper protocols to make sure that it does not, you know, slow down what we have created for so long. And I think we've got to address that one way or the other, and put it on the table for further discussion 
And I think we're doing it with the private sector, which we're doing through the respective chambers. But I think it's, I, I didn't hear us talk a lot about that during the course of today's conference. So people say, what's going to happen when truly the, the, you know, the, the SAD or Secretaria de Hacienda, you know, is no longer relinquishing that, that, that responsibility now to an entity that is strictly Mexican customs for the southbound traffic, you know, as well as for the northbound traffic for that matter as well. We run out of time, but I still have a couple of uh, minutes for final comments. I'm going to start all, all the way around, uh, starting with uh, Lance, with the final comments about the topic that we have today. Well, we're in, we're in trying times for, for, for many reasons, and, and that means we have to try harder to, to bridge those gaps of understanding and, and, um, and communications. I think we have to understand that what we define as problems are, are have impacts on people, and whether those are inspections, whether those are uh, a lack of resources, we have to make the investments in the people so that our companies can grow, so that our borders can prosper, and uh, and I mean that in saying that we, we need more truck drivers, we, we need more uh, CBP officers, we need more aduanas officers. These are some of the things that keep us going. Jerry. I would, I would, I, I definitely would agree. First of all, thank, thank Wilson Center and BTA for, again for having this continuing dialogue. It's important, but um, and I'll, and I'll close with this. Number one, I'm glad to, that Lance is here because, you know, as a, as a USMCA warrior and after warrior, I need, we need to all continue to protect the USMCA and respect the three countries, respect the USMCA. Follow trade, follow your stomach. That's what he does, you know, and and that's that's an important element because that's what drives us. I. You know, uh, looking at what uh, San Diego is a big, very good example of, of private sector with your CBX project uh, as, as, as innovative ideas mm -hmm. to go out there and create the flow of, of, of people. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's an example of so finding solutions to problems. So uh, kudos to, to, you know, Arizona, California, and Texas. I guess we're doing some things right. We're not doing everything wrong. We, we just need to be heard a little bit more, and we need to speak louder. And, and, and making sure that we have some common sense solutions to offer to, to our respective governments and I hope they pay attention. And educate the Congress, right? Absolutely. On, ongoing education. Kenya. Yeah, and I think on that note, I think it's important, you know, as, as decision makers and policy makers come to our border regions, they obviously don't often make the time to meet with the private sector. So it's up to us to keep coming to D.C. We go to Sacramento or Mexico City, and I would take that this opportunity to really encourage everyone to continue to join and support the legation trips, whether with your local chambers or with the Border Alliance, and really share your stories, your challenges, your numbers, your successes, so that um, decision makers really understand the reality that we live in at the border. Kenya, Lance, uh, Gerald, Jerry, thank you. I learned a lot, and I hope everybody did. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you. Thank you.